Welcome to the Stonebridge Community Church online worship service. Today you'll hear the Word of God read, the message from this weekend's in-person service, and two songs to guide you in worship. Thanks for joining us today. Well, for those of you I haven't met yet, or if you're new with us, I'm Pastor John, the senior pastor here at Stonebridge. And for those of you I have met, um, I did get my hair cut, so you may not recognize me. I literally, at the memorial yesterday, had people I've known for almost two years now not recognizing me because I got my hair cut, and I realized it's been way too long. Um, The other thing I want to address before we dive into the sermon here is this could get distracting, but so you know, these are avocados on my shirt. Okay, if you're wondering what they are, my toddler picked out my shirt today because he wanted to be matching with a green shirt, brown pants, so I said, okay. But if you're wondering, it's avocados, and I'm not a huge avocado fan, so go figure. I like guacamole, though. Um, So this is our last week in our, our, our Story, God Story series, where we're hearing some testimonies from people in the congregation. And next week, we're going to be looking at Um, We're going to begin a new series called Intended for Good, looking at the story of Joseph in the book of Genesis. And I wanted to look at Joseph for a couple of reasons. Uh, One, it's one of my favorite stories in the Bible. And two is because our son who was just born is named Joseph. So I thought, let's just reflect on this now. Um, And just, you know, as a family, it was fun for us. So you get to join us in that. So that'll be next week. But this week, we're doing our story, God's story. And we're going to be hearing from Verna Polanis, um, somebody who's been here at Stonebridge, been a member for about two decades now. And Verna's going to share a little bit about her story. So without further ado, let's hear from Verna. Hi, about me. My name is Verna Polanis. Um, I came from Philippines. I migrated here in the United States on 1995 um, through my husband's visa. <clears throat> I was I finished my nursing degree in our country and came here um, with a nursing degree already. And then I moved here in Semi Valley about 19 years now, almost 20 years. I have four children. Both me and my husband are nurses. Um, we have been attending here at Stonebridge Community Church for about 19 or 20 years as well. Coming here to the United States isn't easy. Uh, culturally, it's shocking where I came from a church where you have most of the member of a church, you're surrounded with most of the ch- uh, member of the church, and now coming here far away from your family. Um, but then I found that Stonebridge Community Church is very fulfilling in my desire to be part and belong in the community as they are uh, passionate, um, very sensitive of our needs. And I get to actually grow and learn uh, being part of the care group, um, growth group. And uh, without that, um, it's easy to get lost in your walk through Christ because we can't walk alone. We need the support of our church and being part of the Stonebridge Growth Group, um, helping me develop um, and grow mature in my spiritual walk. I I, I have the sense of belongingness in that group, in that growth group, um, because we can't grow alone. We need um, mentorship. We need a growth group that helps us uh, walk through our Christian faith and life as we navigate uh, our journey of becoming mature in our Christian life. Um, So Stonebridge had helped me. I want to reflect back many years back when Stonebridge has an international growth group. I was once part of that group. And one thing, the beauty behind the International Growth Group is you get to sit to a few people that has different ethnic background, and we get to share um, our own stories, ethnical stories, and learn from that. In fact, at that time, I recall um, we bring our ethnic 
food. Um, um, every week, we assign each in our in that group to bring something unique um, as far as their ethnic um, uh, menu and food, and we get to enjoy it. And so, in a very safe environment with all ethnic different background, we get to know each other uh, in a different way. I want to go back to um, why it's very d different and very difficult to be away from your loved ones, um, away from your relatives, because we don't have relatives here in the United States. But my family I consider now um, is my family in Stonebridge. So first off, thank you to Verna for sharing the story. Um, and her story really is a testament to God's work. We can, yeah, there you go. Her testimony really, her, her story really is a testimony to God's work through the church. The way the Holy Spirit pulled her and her family here to this community two decades ago, long before I was here, long before many of us were here, and has been continually faithful to her and her family through the Holy Spirit. So it felt appropriate to reflect on Paul's vision for the church this week, to look at some of Paul's words about what the church is to be, how it's supposed to function. So I'll be reading from 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 20 through 26, and I invite you to hear the word of God. Paul writes, As it is, there are many members, yet one body. The eye cannot say to the hand, I have no need of you. Nor again the head to the feet, I have no need of you. On the contrary, the members of the body that seem to be weaker are indispensable. And those members of the body that we think less honorable, we clothe with greater honor, and our less respectable members are treated with greater respect, whereas our more respectable members do not need this. But God has so arranged the body, giving the greater honor to the inferior members, that there may be no dissension within the body, but the members may have the same care for one another. If one member suffers, all suffer together with it. If one member is honored, all rejoice together with it. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God for this word, and please join me in prayer. Lord, we thank you for Verna's story, for the story of the Polanis family, Lord. We thank you for your faithfulness to them. We also thank you for the glimpse we get into your work, into your hope for the church through their story. We thank you for Paul's words also. We thank you for the picture that Paul paints for us of the church as a body. Lord, help us to understand our place in your church. Help us to understand our place in the work you're doing. Help us to respond, Lord to you. Speak to us now. We ask this in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. So as I said, Verna's story is a testament to God's faithfulness through the church, to the way that God worked in the life of her and her family when they came here from a culture where they were used to having all sorts of people around, all sorts of church members around, and all of a sudden they felt a little more isolated, a little more disconnected, and then they found a church community here two decades ago, and they've been sustained since in that. I think it's good for us every once in a while to take a step back and to pause and to look at the church, to look at God's work in the church. And really, we've been doing this all summer, for those of you who have been with us, looking at the book of Acts and then looking at this series here of Our Story, God's Story. It's really looking at the way God works in the church, through the church, finding our place in that. But it's good to step back and to just ask the question, what exactly is church? What is church? We all have ideas about what church is. But I think it's good to step back and examine some of those assumptions. The Greek word that gets translated as church in the Bible, it just means called out. The, the ones who are called out. And we know that Jesus is the one who established the church. He called certain people out to be his community. And we know that Paul went on and helped to grow the church through the power of the Holy Spirit. 
But I don't know if that exactly answers for us today. What exactly is the church today? And I think another question that is good to ask also is, why do people come to church? Why do you come to church? Why are you here right now? And I think we would all give different reasons. And if we examine why we come to church, it might help us understand what exactly church is, at least based on our assumptions. I want to say I think all of you would probably give different reasons for why you are here. And there's no bad reason for why you come to church. I want to make that very, very clear. There's no bad reason for why you come to church. But with some reasons, if they're the reasons you continue coming to church, and if your reason never changes, you might be missing out on what the Holy Spirit is inviting you into. I think some people come to church because they feel a sense of honor with the church. It's a good thing to do. They come to church because it feels right. It feels like an honorable thing to do. But notice what Paul says in Corinthians there. When you come to church, the ideas of honor and respect that you see out in the world, they get flipped upside down. One of Paul's main points there was that the people that the world views honorably in the church, they're just normal. And the people that the world views dishonorably, the least honorable, in the church, sometimes they have the highest positions. They have the greatest esteem, the greatest respect. So know that if you come to church expecting to have honor, it's going to change. Your ideas of honor might change. Your ideas of what is right and what is good may change the longer you're part of a church. And I do think that a lot of people still go to church because they want to look like a good citizen, look like a productive member of society. I know that there's a narrative out there that Christians are persecuted and that people who go to church get looked down on. I just want to say, by and large, that's actually not really true when you examine things. Yes, there are some individuals who will experience difficult times in certain settings because they are Christians. But that is not persecution. And we have to draw that distinction. Because there are people in the world right now who are actually facing persecution for following Jesus. And if we start saying that our difficulties are the same as their persecution, it belittles what they are actually experiencing. So I think we have to be careful with that, understand our own place, and Believe me when I say the church is not being persecuted. We are standing here gathering freely in a building that we pay zero taxes on whatsoever. This is not persecution. And we can be grateful to God for that. Whenever I start feeling like maybe I'm being persecuted, whenever I'm tempted to go down that path, I like to imagine that I'm having a conversation with a man named Irenaeus. Irenaeus was an early church father. He wrote a lot of theology. And the end of his life, the way it ended... Um, he was either beheaded by the government in which he lived, or he was fed to lions. I imagine talking to him and explaining to him what I think of as my persecution that I'm experiencing, and pretty quickly I start feeling very silly. Because what we experience here, it's not the same. And the truth is, people do still go to church because it makes you look like a good citizen. College applications love to see when kids are part of a faith community. They don't really care which type of faith community, but being part of a faith community can signal to the world that you are respectable, that you have connections, that you have a community, that you are stable. So sometimes people do come to church for that reason. I want to say again, that's an okay reason for coming to church. But it can't be the reason that sustains you coming to church. If it is, you're missing out on what the Holy Spirit is inviting you into. And then I think sometimes people come to church simply because they want to go somewhere where everybody knows their name. Somewhere where everybody's glad they came. They want to go where people know that their troubles are all the same. Cheers. I'll never get over that joke, by the way. And for those of you who are new, or if you've been here in the last few months, I, I will say, I actually was a big Cheers fan at one point. This has nothing to do with the sermon. This is not something I'm proud of, but there was a point in my life where I would stay up until 1 a.m. and eat an entire sleeve of Oreo cookies with a glass of whole milk and watch two, or two episodes of Cheers at Nick at Night from 1 to 2 a.m. 
So let me say, if that's the reason you come to church, because you want to feel a sense of community, you want church to be like your local pub, that's good, but that's not fully the reason that church exists. It is good to be known. It is good to share problems. It is good to be with people you care about. In fact, that's critical to church, but there's also more to the church than that. All of these reasons are good for coming to the church, but if things don't shift for you, If your reasons don't deepen a little bit, then you're not taking advantage of all the Holy Spirit is inviting you into. And that's why I think it's good to look at Paul's vision for the church. Big picture, when Paul was going around planting churches, when he was going around establishing these communities, the big picture, what he was trying to do, was establish communities in as many cities as possible that were rooted in the confession that Jesus is Lord, and that believed and had hope that Jesus had been raised from the dead, and because of that, they would be raised from the dead too. The proclamation of the early church was that God had overcome death and the resurrection of Jesus. So death was no longer something to be feared. And Paul wanted communities to go out into the communities that they were in, the cities they were in, and bless all the people who didn't believe the same way they did. To serve their enemies, to love their enemies, to bless the towns that they were in so that more people would have hope. Church was intended to give a glimpse of the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of God, so that this world could have hope that God was working and doing more. That's big picture what Paul's purpose for the church was. And that confession, Jesus is Lord, that belief in the resurrection of Jesus, that should be at the core of why we are here, of why you are here. That should be what sustains you, and that should be what defines us all together. But here in Corinthians, Paul goes on to give a deeper picture of the church as well. He doesn't just stay big picture. He starts giving a, a picture of how the church is to function, how we're supposed to interact with one another. And this picture that Paul paints, to me, it's a fairly appealing one. It's one where if you are downtrodden, if you don't have any respect outside in the world, you can come here and you can know that you are valued. You can know that you are respected. That's what Paul is saying there. The hand can't say to the eye, I have no need of you. And the head can't say to the feet, I have no need of you. When you come to the church, you are needed. You are valued. You are important. God has brought you here so that you can contribute to this mission of helping other people have hope in Jesus. Holy Spirit pulls us all together for that purpose, and every single one of us is valuable in that. Last week, Ryan talked about the idea from the Reformation of the priesthood of all believers. Paul's saying the same basic idea. Everybody is called to minister to the world that God loves. Everybody is called to be part of the ministry of the church, and your sin does not define you in the church. That's the vision that Paul is casting here. It's also a vision, like I mentioned, of just status being turned upside down. Different rules apply here. What I love also is Paul doesn't necessarily talk about this specifically in Corinthians, but in other places, there's this picture of the church where it's meant to be a diverse community. We got a glimpse of that in Verna's story when she was talking about the international growth group that Stonebridge had years ago. Different people from different backgrounds coming together on an even footing, sharing their stories, sharing their food together, sharing their culture together. That's a picture of the church that Jesus meant to establish, that Paul meant to grow and to build and to be a part of. Paul talks oftentimes about how whether you're Jew, you're Greek, you're Scythian, I don't really know what Scythian is, but whether you're that, it doesn't matter. You bring that here, you're valued, you're part of the community. This is the vision that Paul lays out for church. Like I said, I feel like it's appealing. At least to me, I think it's an appealing vision. But we also have to be a little careful because when you see an appealing vision of the church, you can start to idealize it. You can start to think that every single church is supposed to be perfect. And when the church isn't perfect, you start to get frustrated and you take your ball and you go home. That's where we have to remember the reality in Corinth that Paul was writing to. 
Paul wasn't writing this letter in general to every single church. He was writing it to one specific church. And the church in Corinth to which Paul was writing was a disaster. This is a church that if they were to hire a church consultant, which we have these days, the church consultant would come in, look at it, and probably say, just start over. You're done. Just start over. This isn't going to work. That's the reality of the church that Paul's writing to when he lays out this vision for the church and how it's supposed to function. And a, a couple of, a few weeks ago, I talked about the church in Corinth, and I read a list of all the problems they were dealing with. I'm going to repeat that list now. The church in Corinth was dealing with division. They had different factions. Some people in the church in Corinth were saying that they follow Peter. Some were saying they follow Apollos. Some say they were following Paul. And Paul's message to them is, no, all of you follow Jesus. He tries to break down those factions so they're not defining themselves by the earthly human leaders that they lift up and idealize. They're dealing with factions and divisions, which I think churches today can relate to. They had sexual immorality there in the church in Corinth. They had Christians suing each other. They couldn't resolve their disagreements, so they were taking each other to court. And usually the powerful were marginalizing the less powerful through the court system. And Paul's telling them, stop. Stop doing this. And they had people preaching that they could do whatever they wanted because they were free in Jesus, that there were no consequences, and ethics just didn't matter whatsoever. They had people engaging in idolatry, going to church sometimes, and then also participating in what was called the emperor cult, worshiping the emperor of Rome as a god. They had people abusing communion by marginalizing the poor. They were saying that rich people got the place of prominence, and they got communion first, and they got more of communion than the poor people did in the church. They were lifting up some spiritual gifts over others. This is actually what Paul's responding to when he lays out his picture of the body of Christ, saying every single gift is needed. That's what Paul's responding to there. They were saying that some spiritual gifts are more important. They are more prominent. They should be more respected. And then they had people denying the resurrection of Jesus. The very reason they were all there in the first place, they were denying it actually happened. When you look at all of this stuff, this church was an absolute disaster. Paul knew that. So when Paul is writing his picture of the church, where all the members of the body value one another, where all the members of the body are treated equally, I have to think he knew they were not going to solve this overnight. They were not going to be perfect overnight. But it was still worth laying out this vision for them. It was still worth giving them a picture of what the church is supposed to look like, one that they could strive for, one that they could hold up, one that they could long for and work to make a reality as best as was possible. I think that's Paul's intent here. I think that's Paul's aim and why he's doing this. I want to say church isn't easy. When you get a bunch of people who are honest they're going to disagree with one another. When you get, to get a bunch of people from different backgrounds, they're going to disagree with one another. It's not easy to resolve that. It's not easy to live in the midst of those types of disagreements. I understand that church isn't easy, but the deeper truth also is that life isn't easy. And one of the main points of the church, one of the calls that Paul gives to the church in Corinth, all the reasons actually that he's laying out this idea of the body of Christ is so that at the end of the day, they would care for one another. I don't know if you caught that when I was reading the scripture, but that's really what this whole section builds up to. Paul wants them to adopt this view so that they would care for one another. And it might sound fairly simplistic, but I think a lot of the problems in the church are solved if we care for one another. And I think a lot of the mission of the church is accomplished if we care for one another in a genuine, authentic way so that the world can see that there is a better way of living life than what they've been offered. That through the respect we have for one another, through the way we are all valued here, the world gets to see a glimpse of how the kingdom of God is supposed to function. Caring for one another is critical. And this is what Verna was talking about. This is what Verna lived in the story that she told us. So here's my invitation to you all. 
We're coming out of summer. We're entering into a new season. Fall begins, new sermon series next week. We're in the midst of fall. The other thing that begins next week is our growth groups. This is what Verna talked about in her testimony there. If you aren't part of a growth group, I want to invite you to sign up for one. I want to encourage you to sign up for one, to get to know people who are sitting next to you because you don't learn to care for one another until you know one another, until you walk alongside one another in life. If you're in a growth group already, invite somebody else into your growth group who isn't in one. The other invitation is when we do our supply drives that we do fairly regularly now, when we do the work days that Pastor Jonathan talked about, sign up for those. Work alongside fellow Christians to bless our community and get to know one another in that way also. And then the other invitation that I have for you is when we do our fellowship events. I think at this point, we've proven in the last few months that we're pretty good at throwing a party. Come and join us. Have fun with us. Play some silly games. Do some games that you never thought you'd ever do. Be goofy, have fun, relax, get to know one another in the midst of that. I want to be very, very clear though. My goal here isn't to leave you with just a to-do list. That's an invitation. If you're not ready, that is okay, but know that that invitation is out there for you, that when you're ready, we're ready for you to dive deeper into this community that's being built here. And the other thing that's important to remember is We don't build the kingdom of God. God is doing that. And the Holy Spirit is the one who sustains the church. You may think that you came here because of a decision, but the Holy Spirit is the one who nudged you here. And when you make that decision to dive deeper into a church community, you might think it's your decision, but the Holy Spirit is the one who is creating the conditions for that decision. This is the work of the Holy Spirit. The invitation here is to come alongside the work the Holy Spirit is doing to pull the church together so that others might have hope, others might get a glimpse of the kingdom of God here, and others might know that God loves them. At the end of the day, my firm belief is that the church is here to spread hope. Hope in the resurrection of Jesus, the hope of Jesus that Jesus proclaimed. That's why we're here, and that to me is what the church is a community based on hope so that that hope in the resurrection can spread. So know that the Holy Spirit invites you into that. May you accept that invitation when you're ready. Please pray with me. Lord, we thank you for Verna's story. We thank you for how you work in the life of her family, Lord. How you deepened their connection to a church community so that the church would eventually become family to them. And Lord, we know that you offer that invitation to each of us now. Help us to be so rooted in the hope in you, the hope in your resurrection, that we dive deeper into church. Help us to be so rooted in the hope and the resurrection that we do what we can to spread that, to help other people share in that, Lord.
Oh, no.